So we've just been hearing from Sarah about the real life situation with medical practitioners at the Austin. Now we're going to hear a very important overview from Didier Pitté. Those of you, as I mentioned in my earlier introduction, Didier has been a world leader in hand hygiene. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Geneva, in the University of Geneva Hospitals, and has a very impressive program there. He's head of the inf a huge infection control department. For those of you who are worried about EFT, I don't. Didier would have 40, 40 or 50 EFT working just in his infection control department. But with that, he's done a lot of good, and uh, one of the things we're going to hear about today is regarding hand hygiene and medical practitioners. Thanks, Didier. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lindsay. It's a pleasure for being here with you. Uh, when I left Geneva, there was snow on the mountains everywhere, and here is supposed to be the beginning of the summer. So it's probably why, <clears throat> and probably also because of the long flight, my voice is a little lost, but uh, no worry, I don't think it's uh, so bad. So let's speak about uh, physician hand hygiene. Um, it's an old story, right? It's not starting from yesterday that we know that physicians have problem with hand hygiene, unfortunately. So uh, it's difficult to speak about physicians and hand hygiene without speaking of Semmelweis. You are in Vienna here. Remember that Vienna at that time was the number one place to go and learn medicine, right? It was the place to be, to be teached medicine. And at that time, uh, Semmelweis, who initially wanted to do uh, forensic medicine, ultimately and finally went to gynecology obstetrics, it was an obstetrician, realized that actually obstetricians and medical students were mostly killing mothers by cross-transmitting infections. At that time we didn't know it was infections, but today we probably think it was a streptococcal infection, as you very well know. And he actually introduced this hand wash bassin. We call, he, we call it hand wash bassin, but we should not call it hand wash bassin because it was chlorinated lime solution that Semmelweis introduced and this is by no way hand washing it was hand antisepsis that was used by this high level chlorinated solution that by the way was killing hands also in addition to kill bacteria right so you know about the story of Semmelweis we uh, together with uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Stewartson when he while he was in Geneva uh, for, for quite a long time, we are still regretting you, Andrew. Uh, did so well, did so many things, and actually this morning you were talking about uh, somewhat uh, uh, enhanced feedback and patient participation, actually with Andrew. We did a cluster randomized uh, control study, and he's the first author of this paper, published in, uh, in September, The Lancet Infectious Disease, which uh, showed th these things. But uh, importantly, Andrew came back on all the data that we, can, we could generate, and these are the maternal mortality rate at the time in Vienna, with actually hand hygiene as a major, actually, intervention that worked so well and saves, actually, lives, lives of mothers lives that were the tip of the iceberg of the problem of healthcare care infection. Some of us should have been celebrated as a hero, as you know, and this is the Faculty of Medicine in Vienna at the time. And do you see Semmelweis? You don't see Semmelweis. He's not in the Faculty of Medicine. He actually, because of his intervention, lost his job and went from Vienna to Budapest. He was from Budapest. Actually, he was from Buda. At that time, Buda and Pest were separated city. And actually, he made the exact same in, uh, observation, the exact same intervention in another obstetric clinic, and actually lost his job again. <laughs> and then, and again, and again, finally end up in an asylum, uh, where he was actually driven by his wife and his best friend, Skoda, who invented the stethoscope. So. It's, it's a very, very sad story. This is Semmelweis, like, you know, uh, the time he introduced the intervention, two and a half year later to three year later, uh, three years later, and you can see that it looks like Semmelweis was probably 10 years older between the two photos, within the two engraftments, by the way. So it's really summarized the crusade to actually embark 
healthcare workers and probably physicians in particular into good hand hygiene compliance. Nobody better than uh, Louis Ferdinand Céline, who is actually the famous French writer, but you may not know that uh, Louis Ferdinand Céline was a doctor, in fact, and wrote his thesis on the life and accomplishment of Semmelweis. It's a fascinating book to read. And the last, in the very last paragraph, here's what he said. I will read it in French, because I, I cannot read Céline in, in, in English, right? <laughs> Il semble que sa découverte dépassa les forces de son génie. Ce fut peut-être là la cause profonde de tous ses malheurs. And it's translated in English. So it's really, really true. Uh, Semmelweis had a real problem, and he had many trouble to convince physicians at the time for many, many reasons. But it was really complicated to make sure that physicians' behavior would be transformed. Tomorrow in my lecture, I will come back on, on different issues because I, uh, I will give this talk that you asked me to give influencing decision makers, and I will come back on, on some of these issues. Now, in 1994 at the University of Geneva, we did the very first large epidemiological study on the behavior of hand hygiene and hand hygiene compliance in particular. And this is one of the graphs. This is actually one of the very first slides that we generated. It was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1999, based on data that we monitored in 1994. It took us actually almost five er years to publish the, the paper. Why? Because the Annals of Internal Medicine did not consider at the beginning, beginning that hand hygiene was any important. Of course, that the journal, uh, th this is the journal of the American College of Physicians. So uh, they didn't like, at, at the beginning, the paper, they say, you should provide a short version. So we worked a lot. We had a unique model that only one epidemiologist could run in the United States in order to run the model. That was a GEE model. But at that time, there was no automatic way to do a GEE. So we had to fly to the US to do the model. And by the way, as you can see, physicians compliance 30%. It's not new, right? And as to compare to the time, nurses compliance 52%. This was according to the ancestors of the five moments, actually a list of indications that we made that was a little complicated that we then simplified to the five moments for the use of WHO. So not new at all. We look at risk factors for the non-compliance the non at the time. And as you know, the major risk factor was time constraint and that's why we moved to alcohol based hand rub and the recommendation within the five mode multimodal element to use system change which is alcohol based hand rub now when you look at these in here in australia physicians compliance lower than the average of other healthcare workers same in germany as you can see nurses versus physicians huge differences no question you look at any data, and so on, and so on, and so on. Because in almost all studies, physicians' compliance is less good than nurses' compliance or other compliance. There are a few exceptions. There are a few exceptions. Some papers coming from uh, Africa, actually, and some others from India. But there are only exceptions. Now, when we look at one of the key problems in hand hygiene, is resistance to change. And I'm sorry, this is very old. It, it, you know, it's very old paper where we look at the resistance to change parameters, where we try to have them grouped into different groups. I don't think it has changed so much from the time. Actually, I have a PhD student working on it, and I can tell you that it hasn't changed so much. And among these, being a physician was definitely one of the risk factors. So it's clear we have to explain that, we have to understand that, and we have to provide model. And today, unfortunately, I will not be able to bring you something that will really help to change the behavior of physicians. There are probably some caveats, but we'll see. Now, one important question is these. Even if the, there are less opportunities for physicians than for others, in particular for nurses, this does not explain the story. Well, you can see here, for example, nurses uh, per 24 hour for healthcare worker, nurses 43. Here uh, on medical ward, on surgical ward 66, as to compare to physicians 15, 17. 
We are not surprised about that. We, we monitored it at the beginning already. We know that physicians have less opportunity per hour of patient care than nurses, and it's obvious. But despite these, their compliance is lower. So it's not a question of the number of opportunities, and that's very important to catch it. So it's, it's even more embarrassing, right? When this is a case, and when you are a physician like me or Lindsay or, or others. So now, are the difference in compliance uh, between physician and nurses real? I mean, is it real? Or is it, are, are they just studies? Well, it seems to be very real, according to at least two studies, and I don't, didn't want to pull out our, our studies, but uh, you can see that there's a big difference here in the, the study on the left-hand side. And even if you use convert observer and non-convert observers using different either IPC or link nurses, there are many, many ways to do convert observations. There is always a, 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 an observer bias, always. It could be as low as 5%, could be as low as high as 40, even 50%. It always exists. So, uh, but as you can see, even despite of this fact, of course, physicians are subject to observer bi observation bias, as you can see here, even more than nurses. So, there is definitely truth behind the data. It's very clear that physicians are less compliant than, say, nurses, but others. Well, there is always something that I could tell is physicians are more compliant in Geneva than radiology technicians before they were educated. But when I educated them, nobody ever, ever speak to them about hand hygiene. They didn't know what, what mean hand hygiene. So I think that this is clear that we have to find a solution. So why is it that physicians have this low compliance, lower than almost anybody else, uh, even if they have the same number or lower number of opportunities for hand hygiene action? Now, importantly, and I don't think it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's fun, but you, you need to look at the insights from the culture and, and the media. There is a problem there, and I will give you two examples, but there are many problems. One example, I like this study where they look at 800 photos of nurses and 800 photos of physicians, or pretended uh, physicians, uh, um, uh, actors that pretend to be doctors, actors that pretend to be nurses. Usually they are really nice looking, right? <laughs> wow, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, it's, it's, okay, that's one thing. I have nothing against it. But you look at the criteria here of what is bad behavior. It's not very, very important. I mean, we're not talking about behavior is a lot more important, but look, to look at photos only, at least one incorrect behavior in 88.8% of the photos with a doctor and only 27.5% of the photos with a nurse. Tells you a lot. It tells you that, yes, the doctor can be a cowboy and, and do what he wants, provided he's nice looking, right? <laughs> so this is, this is really something that we need to change. This is really something we need to change. I love the study that was presented earlier. We have the exact same observations in, in Geneva. It's very, very clear that when we feedback, when I, and I usually do it, still, still I'm doing it, when we provide the feedback to the physicians, to the head physicians of the compliance in their own department, you should see in a room with 69 head physicians, and you should see the ambience. I mean, usually pediatricians are quite good. So you can see the pediatrician who is kind of small is standing like this and look at uh, pediatricians. And I say, no, 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 pediatrician, you are still around 78%. It's not that good, you know. Uh, but of course, when you look at radiologists or surgeons, they are much lower. So there, there are cultural differences. There are atti different attitudes. There are, there are different things. But nevertheless, I think we should work on that. Because if we tolerate those bad images to continue, it's really bad. And what is even worse is these. <laughs> this series is a disaster, <laughs> right? So, and I will tell you what I did. Now, you look at this. Somebody, uh, actually, whom I met, 
did a study published in the Lancet. Look at this. It, it's terrible. They look at 100 TV uh, shows of this series. I mean, you need to be very courageous to do that, <laughs> right? I would never be doing it. But anyway, look at incorrect usage of, of protective barriers, 25%, let's say 24.7%. Look at 207 opportunities for the correct disposal of sharpened object. Look at the compliance, very, very poor, 0.9%. Look at the compliance for hand hygiene, 0.02%. So it's even worse than reality. But think about the number of people who have watched ER. So the bad habits. It, it should not be tolerated. So I, what I did, I, I, I sent a letter to Hollywood, actually, <laughs> telling them, and I never got an answer. So what I did is I gave a talk, and th then I got some people coming to me and say, uh, well, are you sure it's serious? I mean, I mean it's more than, it's 100 episodes. Watch really with the five moments for hand hygiene. It's just a disaster. So it needs to be corrected. It needs to be corrected. It does not explain why our surgeons are, and our medical doctors, because the surgeons are not the only one to blame. Obviously, it, it's not the answer, but this is also important. If you tolerate that, you know, you would never tolerate any of those mistakes, speaking of the FBI or speaking of whatever. Uh, so it, it needs to be serious. Now, my last uh, talk with, with the Hollywood product production of ER is that they are seven years in advance. So if I change, if we can cope to change it now, it will happen only in seven years. So I think we should better do ba bad publicity for this series uh, rather than try to change it because it's too late. So in a pa paper we published in 2004, where we look at physicians only, we look at the physicians, we monitor physicians only, we look at their behavior, I mean, we look at the risk factors for non-compliance. In red, you have the risk factor for non-compliance. High workload, certainly important, like for nurses. Opportunities associated with highest risk of cross-transmission. Now, at the time we were scoring these, it's like physicians would not recognize the high opportunity for cross-transmission, like moment number two. They just don't recognize it. So it's important for education to know that. Then being a surgeon, anesthesiologist, ER doctor, I guess that you would be speaking of ER later, uh, and, and intensive care. These are risk factor for non-compliance. This is just about education, education, and probably role model. Role model is definitely very important to help physicians. So perception of being a, a, a good role model is really important. And that's probably one of the parameters we should work on. And that's very important. Uh, awareness of being observed, as I said. Being medical students in our institution is a re it's a really actually a, a, a good parameter for better compliance. But I need to explain to you that 20 years ago we started to mo not only to teach them, that, but to have it in the exams. And it has a very, very high weight. So uh, actually it's biased because of course when they come back from medical school they are really good. And even when they move to other hospitals in Switzerland people could recognize that they were trained in Geneva because their behavior in hand hygiene is much higher. That's good news. The bad news are that when those medical students are going into the ward, whether it's be in surgery, in medical practice, in, in medicine, in pediatric whatsoever, if the role models are bad, they rapidly become really average and are not among the best anymore. So that's a very important take of message. Pocket carriage of alcohol-based hand rub helps. It helps a lot as compared to dispensers on the wall, uh, of course, because you carry it with you whenever and wherever you are. Positive attitude toward hand hygiene after patient contact is also extremely important. And internal medicine, geriatric and pediatrics usually are a little better than uh, the other. So here, uh, the important behavior determinant of hand hygiene among physicians. Physicians overestimate their hand hygiene compliance and knowledge usually and are very skeptical to expert recommendation. We know about it. So we need to push them evidence. To push evidence to physicians will help. And this is very, very true. 
major importance of role model from superiors if the role model are, are good the medical hierarchy is a critical factor in physicians good hand hygiene behavior so think about it educate the the, the role models at the the high level of the the the, the hierarchy will be good lack of positive feedback of performing hand hygiene from superiors, colleagues, or patients. It's very rare that actually this, this effective factor is worked at, you know. It's very rare that the head of surgery would tell you, thank you very much, you are very good at hand hygiene compliance, right? So this is something we should work uh, on because this is very important. Now, a uh, sense of professional role, I should, we should work on it because it is important and identity hand hygiene seen as too simple another priority for a physician when we started doing science on hand hygiene my peers looked at me and said this is science for nurses this is not for you you are an academic physician you know and so for those who will come to the movie tonight clean hands this is something that has been yeah that that, that was a reality nowadays it's different but i think that Somewhere it continues probably to be true in the mind of some people, right? Think about, about those people, those people who are saving lives or they have the impression that they are saving lives because they are saving one patient coming out from the operating theater. With good hand hygiene, we are saving millions of lives, but we don't see it on a daily basis. So it makes a, it makes, it makes a difference. So we should continue to work on that. Concern about patients' perceptions and the interaction between hand hygiene and patient care. So I think it's important that patients start to remind not only physicians, but healthcare workers in particular about hand hygiene. And last but not least, hand hygiene requires a conscious decision making. Not, it's not an, an automated process. Probably for nurses, it's, a, it, it's it becoming an automated process for physicians it's still a little bit difficult but it could become an automated process i can tell you that our, the, our previous prior head of bone marrow transplant unit could clean his hands all the time was 100 percent compliant more than 100 even because sometimes during committee meeting he was rubbing his hands and i say you don't need to do it i mean you, don't, you, you clearly don't need to do it so it's something that 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 is important to to be recalled. Now, the role of the hierarchy in hand hygiene among physicians is, is very well known. There are two studies that I choose to show you. Uh, one is the impact of the attending physician compliance while people are entering the room or exiting the room and clearly it makes a big difference. Once again, the role model is very important. And I like this study published in ISHE where among medical students, 83% were willing to remind few fellow students about hand hygiene, but only 30% uh, uh, of, uh, of them were willing to do for interns and 16% for residents, 9% for registrars, and 6% to consultants. So the hierarchy model should be completely modified. And I think I know it's not easy to do. And this, these are something that, that we need to think about in order to make a change. So conclusions. Reinforce the WHO hand hygiene multimodal strategy among physicians. We never really developed a, a, a specific curricula for physicians. We have introduced the curricula in many universities around the world, but we never pushed it to the end. And this is something we should do. Adapt, adapt the strategy. And I think that's, that's very important to specific medical team needs. This is very important. We have adapted the strategy in many words, like in pediatric ICU, neonatal ICU, and so on. We have adapted the five moments in, in actually hemodialysis. We never did it in, in specifically for some physicians. Engage the medical hierarchy is absolutely essential. It is absolutely essential, and this is something we need to do better and involve patients. Regarding ADAPT, I would like to say that this is true for many things in hand hygiene promotion as well as in behavioral science. I don't know if some of you have, may have accessed this TEDx talk that I gave uh, some time ago. It's really about ADAPT to ADOPT. If you want people to ADAPT a strategy, ADOPT the strategy you have been promoting, you should let them ADAPT it to their own resources, to their habits, to their 
cultural background and whatever this is absolutely key so this is probably what we should do with many of our colleagues but including of course the physicians and i would like to invite you for the premiere of the australian premiere of the clean hands movie a little later today at 4 30 where some of those uh, things would be not among physicians but would be discussed and debated and that would be the the occasion for uh, you to receive if you like the clean hands save lives book that summarizes some of the the discussion that we had for the past actually 20 years on hand hygiene promotion thank you very much for your attention <laughs>